Okay, so welcome to another session on Brexit, uh, but this time we're delighted to have with us the ambassador of the United Kingdom to Greece, Kate Smith, who is on her second stint, I believe, in Greece. You, you began your diplomatic career here, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it's, a, uh, it's been a long day and it is a very, very complicated issue, but uh, I would like to begin with you telling us uh, where we are right now, 28 days before the uh, Article 50 deadline expires. Okay, thanks very much, Yanni, and uh, uh, thanks for everyone staying through a number of uh, fascinating sessions on Brexit, which I think this is the last one. Um, those of you who've heard the previous sessions will have heard the process explained of what's going to happen in the next uh, immediate days and weeks. So I don't think I will go over that again, and anyway, you can find it on the BBC website. Um, very well explained. Um, I, th I think what I would want to stress um, is a lot of discussion at the moment about the likelihood of no deal. Um, is this really uh, a reality facing us? Um, the fact is that the only way of avoiding no deal is for our parliament to agree a deal. And the deal that is on the table at the moment is, in my government's view, the best possible one available. Uh, so the efforts going on at the moment for our, our Prime Minister uh, to, to do two things, essentially. One is to get those <coughs> uh, additions, amendments, uh, alternative arrangements, whatever form it takes, to the Northern Ireland Protocol that will satisfy Parliament. So that's, that's the dynamic in Brussels. And then the dynamic, of course, um, back in Westminster, uh, is to ensure that there is a majority to back that deal, that slightly amended deal, when it comes uh, for a meaningful vote on the 12th of March. Uh, if it doesn't pass, then there are two more votes in successive days uh, which will test Parliament on uh, leaving the EU without a deal and on the question of extension. So, in a nutshell, that's where we are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds not terribly straightforward, but understandable. Um, is there, I mean, given that we are now, after uh, years of negotiation, uh, very close to the deadline, um, is there anything you can tell us about uh, contingency planning uh, for the British community here in Greece uh, if uh, the worst uh, outcome happens on the 29th of March? And are there, are there uh, bilateral deals uh, between the UK and Greece to safeguard the rights of British expatriates here and Greeks living in the UK? Well, thanks um, for raising that, Yanni. Um, right from the beginning of this process, um, the rights of citizens in both directions, uh, European Union citizens in the UK and UK uh, nationals living in the countries of the EU has been the priority for both sides. Um, and when we talk about the deal on the table, a substantive part of that, certainly in terms of the numbers of pages in it, is devoted to securing those rights. And um, substantially, it means uh, that all of those citizens that find themselves in what we call technically a cross-border situation will have their rights to continue to live and work, lead their lives as they do today, access benefits. It's a very, very good deal. That's the citizens' rights element of the withdrawal agreement. Now, of course, because as we approach 29th of March, um, the possibility uh, of no deal uh, is staring us ever more in the face, although it is, by, as you know, not uh, the government's uh, intention and not its expectation either. But because that is a possibility, um, any responsible government has to take contingency measures. So on the question of citizens' rights, uh, what that meant was, I think, last November, the British government made a unilateral commitment, uh, not in every detail exactly the same, but very broadly, again, guaranteeing unilaterally the rights of European Union citizens in the UK. And since then, we have seen a process of um, a number of EU27 governments, in fact, the majority now, I think by, by now, actually, the vast majority, have made a reciprocal commitment. Um, and this um, was just also delivered in Greece uh, about two weeks ago, and we were delighted um, with that, from a, minister, a letter from Minister uh, Katrungolos, 
uh, to assure a reciprocal arrangement um, in Greece for those, for a really substantial community, 45,000 Brits who have made Greece their permanent home. It's a very valued and welcomed community, and we've heard that from the Greek government as well. So that has been an enormous relief um, for British nationals. Uh, and here and in to Greece. be clear, the agreement is that even if there is uh, a no-deal scenario, then the the rights of the two communities are reciprocally guaranteed. This is exactly guaranteed. in the circumstances of no deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, there are still some issues that have to be worked out, um, but fundamentally, the right to continue to live and work um, is mm -hmm. preserved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit, you, you've been here now, is it a little over two years? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, already in the, in the Brexit era, let us say. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how, what uh, British expatriates here have been telling you about the, the Brexit process and their feelings towards it, uh, how this has evolved from 2017 to mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. if it has evolved? Yes, well, as I said, it's, it's, uh, it's a not insubstantial community in terms of size, um, and we have the opportunity to hear from uh, the Brits in Greece uh, a lot. Um, this is through our social media channels, um, we communicate through our websites and so on a lot, but also we go out and meet them. Um, just in recent weeks, I've done what we call outreach sessions in, in Athens, in Thessaloniki, in Rhodes, several in Crete. Um, so we hear from them direct. and. As with any group of British people, they have strong views about Brexit and they express them. And I've heard a variety of views in those sessions. But overwhelmingly, um, the views that we hear refer to really practical issues about their status in Greece. These are people who've built their lives here. Um, many are married to Greeks. Many um, have bought property. Many are working here. It's quite a mixed population. Um, and there has been deep anxiety about their ability to continue um, because of Brexit. Um, so that reassurance we got a couple of weeks ago um, was really, really significant. Mm -hmm. um, now, you asked about the change, uh, Yanni, over the, over the period I've been here. Um, I think the main one has been is that the anxiety has become more and more intense as we've approached the 29th of March without having the assurance on the Greek side now we have that, um, but that, that was the main change I, I have felt over that period. So if we look a little bit further on and we assume that there is a deal uh, closely resembling what's now on the table, um, how optimistic are you about the continuation of, of bilateral links? I mean, we have very strong links in tourism, in education, mm. in shipping. Are you optimistic that these will continue or do you think that the departure will be an obstacle? Well, these links that you've just described, Yanni, and absolutely uh, correctly, in, in tourism, shipping, business, in education particularly, um, are very, very strong. These are, this is the sort of people-to-people -people stuff that unites our two countries, which has been a, the contemporary form of a long-standing historical uh, cultural relationship. Um, and of course, much of this existed before the European Union was invented. Um, so I think there's no reason to think this is going to disappear uh, overnight, not at all, because it's built on people-to-people -people relationships, essentially. Um, now, the agreement um, that is on the table, which includes the political declaration, which sets the framework for the future relationship in uh, trade and investment and security and foreign policy cooperation, if that is delivered, and if that is agreed, and goes, uh, we get into the next phase of negotiations, uh, that will uh, facilitate the continuation of our current relationship. Um, obviously, with some changes, there will be some fundamental changes. But that's the framework in which our relationship is going to be best able to continue as it is. But I don't think um, it will disappear without that. We will certainly find other um, forms of cooperation um, if, if that future framework negotiation doesn't pan out the way we would like it to. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, without getting too much into the politics, could you give us your sense of why it has been so difficult for, for Britain to arrive at the version of Brexit that it can support in the parliament and, and get this thing done? Well, I think I would say this, to me, this isn't a surprise. Um, this is a sort of once-in-a-generational political question and decision. 
uh, of extraordinary significance. And it is hardly surprising uh, that it has aroused such passions, is so controversial, and is so contested. And while, admittedly, the referendum result was clear, it was still pretty close. So I think this is not surprising to me um, that we find ourselves in, in the current political circumstances in the UK that, that we are. To me, actually, uh, what we see going on in Parliament in the last few months is um, a confirmation of the strength of our parliamentary democracy. Um, and Parliament, as I think some of the previous panellists said, will find a way through this. As for changes in the party system, well, that's entirely natural. It happens in every country in the world as uh, political conditions and circumstances change. Things develop within uh, parties. Um, but at the moment, it's a pretty limited change that we've seen with um, a, a handful of MPs becoming independent. I mean, to take a comparison with Greece, an equally controversial uh, decision that went through the Greek parliament uh, quite recently uh, also created uh, some flurries in the party system. So I think that's an entirely natural effect. We've been uh, much more in flux, I would say, in, in general over the, over the last few years. That's, that's certainly true. Um, another issue that came up in the, in the previous panels, uh, which I think everyone would like to hear from you on, um, is the issue uh, not just on the, on the bilateral level, but on the level of, of British cooperation with the EU after Brexit, uh, is the issue of security and mm. the issue of um, intelligence cooperation, which are both crucially important and, and in both of which the UK plays a, a, a very significant role. Are mm. you confident that this kind of cooperation will continue even if you know, the initial stages will be difficult if there's a no-deal uh, exit? I'm glad you asked. Uh, this question, Yanni, because um, as you'd have heard in the previous panels, an, an awful lot of discussion about the future relationship and impacts on the relationship and the two sides focuses on the economic relationship. But the security relationship is just as important. Um, now, what we are looking for from the next phase of negotiations, when and if, hopefully, uh, the withdrawal uh, agreement goes through, is a really ambitious uh, arrangement for continuing our foreign policy and defense and security cooperation. Um, my government, the Prime Minister, has made it absolutely clear, again from the beginning, that Britain's commitment to European security, to the security of all European citizens, is non-negotiable. Um, and we are ready and willing to continue to cooperate with our European Union partners, to continue to collaborate, to continue to participate in uh, European operations, to share and make available our capabilities, assets, intelligence sharing as well. And that's the framework on the security side that will be picked up once we've got through this um, previous, uh, this current phase. Just what we need to discuss is exactly how that is going to work. Um, we believe there are ways um, that we can do that, um, and of course the aim is to maximize uh, the cooperation uh, that is available. That's just important for our security, it's pretty fundamental. Now of course, if talking about no deal, um, no deal also affects uh, these sorts of areas as well. Uh, what we are having discussions about with our European partners at the moment is um, contingency planning for continuing the absolute fundamental important areas of cooperation on justice, on law enforcement, and on intelligence sharing as well. And if I may add, and this is really important for the relationship with Greece and for Greece itself, uh, because we do an awful lot of very important work with the Greek uh, security and justice authorities in counterterrorism, on serious organized crime, particularly um, migration crime, on smuggling, um, on money laundering. Um, a lot of this cooperation is not terribly visible very widely, but it's very, very important, and we need to find ways to continue that, whether in no deal or hopefully with a deal. Um, I'd like to turn a little bit to the, the uh, other side of the negotiation, the EU. The EU um, has been driven with division on a number of fronts in recent years, be it the, the Euro crisis, the migration crisis, uh, but it has been uh, impressively united in the negotiation with the UK, 
Uh, has that surprised you? That's my first question. I didn't think so. Um, I mean, it's clearly a negotiation that takes place on two sides of the table. Um, and uh, it would be very odd if you were seeing different positions on the opposite side of the table. But we've seen with Europe that that is often the case. And especially on foreign policy issues, uh, you have a number of countries that take a different uh, stand. And, and we didn't see any of that in, in, in this case, really. Well, I think the European Union um, decided on the way it was going to negotiate with the UK, which was to uh, appoint a commission representative, Michel Barnier, to conduct those negotiations. So there is a single point of contact and a single voice. Um, so a united position is not something that surprises me. And I think I would add, thank God it is a united position. I mean, the idea that we would have to negotiate on all of this separately with 27, if you think the negotiation's been dif difficult as it is, just imagine how it would have been in that circumstance. Um, now, uh, when you came here as ambassador, uh, the, the, the suffix exit referred to Brexit because Grexit was, was uh, thankfully out of the picture. But uh, of course, a, a couple of years earlier, things were very different. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, first of all, what is your sense of the situation in Greece in the last couple of years? Do you feel that the, the country's, uh, the, the economic uh, recovery is really taking hold and things are, we've really put the worst behind us? And, and also, what would you say has surprised you more about Greek life, especially given the fact that you have lived here before? Well, I think, and I, I think this is a wonderfully positive thing. When you look at economic indicators, more or less across the board now in Greece, um, a lot of them have turned positive, and that's a great thing for the Greek economy. It's great for confidence, consumer confidence, um, exports, foreign investment, um, employment, uh, all up, um, which is great. Uh, I won't be the first person, I certainly am not the first person at this conference, and I won't be the last to say that what is really important in that trajectory is uh, continued adherence to the undertakings on reform uh, that have been made. That's an incredibly important message uh, for markets and for investors. Um, and more widely, for continued improvements in the business environment. Mm -hmm. if, if I may take a little bit of time on this. Sure. I'm going to give you some examples. And these are examples of British uh, investments in Greece. So uh, if you take TAP, an iconic in energy investment, which is genuinely turning Greece into an uh, energy hub in the region, uh, BP is, has a 20% share of that new investment, a 1.5 billion investment. So that's BP. Have they regretted it yet? Or? Certainly not. Certainly <laughs> not. Vodafone. 25% of the telecoms uh, market in Greece, uh, and in the process of making, a, in the first phase, 200 million investment in the fiber optic network. On a slightly smaller scale, but really indicative and interesting, a UK-based fund, Pillarstone, uh, which has a number of interests in Greece, but recently put 58 million into an excellent Greek company called FAMAR, and have brought in new management and new capital uh, to keep that company going, which means 800 jobs being saved. And a final example, which is, again, an iconic one because it's in tourism and property, um, as a UK uh, fund uh, leading a major, major tourism investment in this region of Greece, actually, Atalanti Hills, 500 million euro investment, um, and that will mean in the first phase 1,500 jobs and 1,000 um, going forward. Now, why do I give you all these examples? Because to take them in turn, they all depend on exactly those sorts of trajectories in the business environment and in reform. So why did TAP succeed? Because that was a major foreign strategic investor who got the absolute 100% backing of the Greek government. Vodafone, Vodafone has benefited from the freeing up of the telecoms market and allowing new players to come in uh, to that sector. Pillarstone has succeeded in a restructuring uh, because the banks are now cooperating on allowing these sorts of restructurings and changes to deal with indebted companies uh, mm -hmm. to be resolved. Um, and finally, with Atalanti Hills, we saw after many, many years of delay 
the presidential decree uh, licensing and permissions process finally go through on a reasonably fast track at the end. So those are just examples. That what needs to be done to bring foreign investors in, and it's foreign investment that you will hear from everyone participating in a session on the economy here at this conference is what Greece needs. And is it, are, are you hearing more from British investors? Are they more interested in the Greek economy than they were two years ago, for example? There is certainly more interest. I was in London uh, two, three weeks ago meeting a range of different companies. Um, there is a lot of interest, but they need continual reassurance that that direction of travel is not going to be blown off course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They will need that reassurance for a while, I think. Um, and uh, as for what has uh, surprised, surprised you more? Uh, well, I'm going to stick. In, in I'm, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm going to stick with the economy. I think, actually, when you learn more and more about what Greece and Greeks in particular have suffered in the crisis, it is extraordinary that this country, in a sense, has stayed on its feet. Um, I mean, you, it's, it's almost inconceivable to think of 25% of GDP being wiped off an economy and a country just not falling over. Um, now, of course, Greece has had a lot of support, but I think a lot of that speaks to, to the incredibly strong social underpinnings of this country. Um, you know, family bonds, uh, community bonds, uh, which have really kept the place going um, under extraordinary pressure. So I think that was one of the surprises to me. Um, and I think um, the other side, actually, and I really want to make this point because I think it's so important and it, you don't hear it enough and it's not celebrated enough. Greece has some fantastic companies. Um, now, we hear a lot about startups as well, and that's fantastic because there is a great startup ecosystem here, and a lot of it has links into London as well, um, and a lot of great support going for that. But Greece has also got some great large and medium sized companies um, which are world beating in their particular sectors. And I've been visiting a few of those that have links with the UK. These are Greek companies investing in the UK. Um, so I've been to see uh, Coca-Cola 3E, has a factory in Northern Ireland. Um, I've been to see El Valhalcor, Via Halco, which has a factory, a substantial factory, um, Bridge North in the Midlands. And then, of course, there are the companies that export to the UK, and for, the, for which the UK is an incredibly significant market. Like recently, I was up at Cree Cree, near Ceres, and a um, smaller company, but also with a very, very high profile of exports to the UK, um, seven grapes down in uh, Corinthia. Um, and all of these companies are high tech, very strong corporate governance, great employers, innovative and growing. And I think that should be celebrated more and more. Should we take one or two quick questions uh, at the end? Some questions for the ambassador? Yes. Good. You, you just celebrated the fact that Greek companies are benefiting from UK bilateral arrangements. Will they be imperiled by Brexit? Well, I want to come back again to the future economic partnership, um, which we slightly sort of skirted around, I think, in some of the previous discussions. Um, we talked about, in the, we heard about in the previous panel, almost sort of two extremes, you know, no deal, um, plus uh, staying in the EU and in the single market. Now, what the future economic partnership, that part of the future framework, seeks to do is to get the broadest, deepest possible free trade agreement between the UK and the EU, which respects the principles of the referendum, which for our government means the ability to conduct new tra trade deals, so it means outside the customs union, and preserves the integrity of the single market for the EU side. So that means there will be changes, clearly. Um, but what is in that future framework uh, proposal in the political de declaration delivers a great deal in terms of uh, tariff-free trade on goods and as free as possible access in services. 
Um, so if we can get into that and finalize the details of that in the next phase, I'm pretty confident that those trading and investment relationships will not be damaged. And a very quick final question. Gentleman here, second row. Hi, um, I, I'm one of the British expats here. Uh, we've hi. met before, so hi again. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question which you probably can't answer, particularly you're on TV. But um, uh, what, uh, the Foreign Office has been historically you know, the most pro-European part of government. Uh, if you can answer to any extent, what, what kind of effect has uh, Brexit had on the way the Foreign Office looks at its role going forward? I can answer that question, and I'm going to answer it, and it's true, in a really positive way, uh, because it has mobilized the Foreign Office to deliver on a political decision, and that is exactly what the public service does. Um, and it's mobilized it because it is the biggest challenge of that kind um, that any serving diplomat can remember. Um, so, irrespective of people's personal views or as you interpret it, the overall trend of the, uh, of the department, which I wouldn't comment on. Um, people feel a great challenge, um, and I think Mujtaba referred to that as well. People are getting on with it. It's a huge amount of work. It's, it's an enormous challenge, but people enjoy that, and I, I am filled with admiration for my colleagues who are working on this at the moment, because they want to deliver the absolute best deal that is available. On that note, Ambassador, thank you very much.